we're really lucky to have Ilaria Baldini. She's a feminist, anti-violence activist, abolitionist, and member of Resistenza Feminista uh, from Italy. And she's talking on the female body in prostitution and patriarchy. So um, I will speak about prostitution uh, in, in patri the, the, the female body in prostitution and in patriarchy. Prostitution, as we know, has been defined and sadly continues to be called the world's oldest profession. And even more sadly, it is being defended as a, a job like any other by feminists who falsely accuse abolitionists of judging and condemning women in prostitution. Many of those who defend prostitution appear to imply that there is nothing wrong in prostitution, at least nothing more than any other kind of wage labor exploitation. Others argue that to speak of the violence and damage that occur in prostitution turns women into victims deprived of agency and claim that damage doesn't occur because what is being sold in prostitution is not access to and use of a woman's body, but simply sexual services. Those who claim this say that speaking of violence would imply a loss of agency, wrongly equating being made the object of violence with no longer being a subject. Furthermore, they claim that such services could be sold and bought regardless of the sex of the people involved, in spite of what the numbers tell us, that is that women and girls constitute the large majority of those trafficked for sexual exploitation purposes and involved in all forms of prostitution, and that it is almost invariably men who buy sexual access to women or to other men and boys. On the opposite side, in her essay, What's Wrong with Prostitution? Carol Pateman argues that a lot is wrong with it, and my intention today is to start a brief journey into what is the role of the female body in prostitution and what happens to it, beginning with Pateman's important observations on the fundamental difference between prostitution and all forms of labor. I hope that in the end, it will be very clear that there are reasons of different orders as to why normalizing prostitution today appears so vital to so many people and why when survivors tell their stories of violence and abuse, very often they are silenced or accused of lying. Prostitution has been used by Marx and Marxists as a metaphor for the exploitation of every mainly male worker. In fact, in prostitution, just as in wage labor, the body of the worker is fundamental, but there is also an equally fundamental difference. To quote Pateman, the employment contract gives the employer right of command over the use of the worker's labor, that is to say over the self, person and body of the worker, during the period set down in the employment contract. Similarly, the services of the prostitute cannot be provided unless she is present. Property in the person, unlike material property, cannot be separated from its owner. The John, the punter, the man who contracts to use the services of the prostitute, like the employer, gains command over the use of her person and body for the duration of the prostitution contract. But at this point, the comparison between the wage slave and the prostitute, the employment contract and the prostitution contract breaks down. In contrast to employers, the men who enter into the prostitution contract have only one interest, the prostitute and her body. End of our quotation. Why that interest? The answer is fairly obvious and Pateman provides it very clearly. Things immediately become more interesting with respect to the gender neutral occupation theory. Again, I quote, when a man enters into the prostitution contract, writes Pateman, he is not interested in sexually indifferent, disembodied services. He contracts to buy sexual use of a woman for a given period. In fact, he does not buy just the body, as not only is a self inseparable from the body, but as Pateman continues, human bodies and selves are also sexually differentiated. The self is a masculine or feminine self. One illustration of the integral connection between the body and the self is the widespread use of vulgar terms for women's sexual organs to refer to women themselves. The role of prostitution, she concludes, is to serve the patriarchal construction of the difference between masculinity and femininity as the political difference between freedom and subjection. Sexual mastery is the major means through which men affirm their manhood. And therefore her conclusion is that when women's bodies are on sale as commodities in the capitalist market, the law of male sex rights is publicly affirmed and men gain public acknowledgement as women's sexual masters. That is what is wrong with prostitution. <laughs>
For time reasons, I, I have to leave aside here some concrete examples that prove the concentration on the female reproductive body in prostitution to concentrate on some aspects of prostitution that are less discussed and that I would like to bring to our attention because they reveal some of the deep mechanisms through which prostitution operates as a central tool of patriarchy to sustain itself and have a lot to do with what happens to the traumatized body in prostitution, female body. When Peyton describes the mechanism at work in prostitution, she mentions the need for prostituted women to distance themselves from the situation in which they find themselves. A distancing that allows them to survive, to not surrender their self together with their body to the man who is buying total control over another human being, a sexuated being, a woman. It is a distancing that the punters do not appreciate. It is correctly called dissociation and it is, as we know, what happens to those who are raped. I would like to turn here to the testimony of Rachel Moran in her book, Paid For. Writes Rachel, the age old practice of using an alias is an example of how prostituted women have always actively sought to separate themselves from what they do. This is dissociation at the most practical level. For women in prostitution, dissociation is a necessary but dangerous thing. Continually denying any painful lived reality inevitably causes a person to become separated from their own self. She is cut by either side of a two-edged sword. She is, in other words, psychologically polluted by prostitution to the exact extent to which she manages to disconnect from it. But if she were to not to disconnect from prostitution, she would be equally polluted by her proximity to it. She would just find herself polluted in a more presently painful way. Here is the essence, again, these are all uh, Rachel's words. Here is the essence of the paradox. To dissociate is to break away from and to turn away from. It is essential here. The prostituted cannot maintain her identity or sanity without it, but the cruel double bind is that on a psychological level, dissociation is a betrayal of the self. She's damned if she does and damned if she doesn't on the deepest of levels. Every time a prostitute numbs her inner self against the feel of unwanted hands on her body, she both employs dissociation and suffers separation of self. Of course, men know perfectly well what happens which is why they enjoy trying to prevent women from dissociating as happens with the request of the girlfriend experience. And they complain about it. There is no prostitute who will give you what you want from her heart. She screams and does other things, but it's all a lie, says an interviewed 33 year old single man, a university graduate. Another one, 27 year old in a relationship declares, women in prostitution fool you into thinking they are enjoying themselves, but no, they." They work in prostitution just so they can live. They fool you into believing she's enjoying herself so you become satisfied. Do men get fooled? Apparently not. Or do they decide to fool themselves? And do they really? Or don't they rather enjoy precisely the game and the sense of power it provides? These quotes are all from a research conducted in Lebanon by the CAF Association, but the, the answers of similar researchers in other countries are all along the same lines. Importantly and not surprisingly, as we all know all too well, dissociation is an experience with which all women are familiar to a certain extent. Moran quotes, among others, a passage from Jane Fonda's autobiography, uh, Fonda. In my public life, I am a strong can-do woman. How is it then that behind closed doors in my most intimate relations, I could betray myself? The answer is this, if a woman has become disembodied from a lack of self-worth, I'm not good enough or from abuse, she will neglect her own voice of desire. This requires compartmentalizing, disconnecting head and heart, body and soul. According to Mora, many women are strongly encouraged in the direction of this silencing of their own desire and voice to please not themselves, but to be pleasing to others by a mindset outside of themselves. So the final part of my journey will connect prostitution to the deep mechanisms on which patriarchy relies for its functioning and existence, to connect prostitution and the creation of the patriarchal mindset. Prostitution is at the center of the functioning of patriarchy. And to conclude, I will try to indicate how and why, drawing some conclusions about the more recent attempts to hide this centrality through the diversion of gender.
In the book, Why Does Patriarchy Persist? Carol Gilligan defines patriarchy as a culture based on a gender binary and hierarchy, which leads us to see human capacities as either masculine or feminine, privileging the masculine, and forces a split between the self and relationships. In other words, patriarchy and its tool, gender, function through the constant production of a process of dissociation, a detachment from ourselves. In simple terms, she says that patriarchy is a system that maintains hierarchy and power structures thanks to a gender system that initiates men and women into precise roles. Men have to separate their mind from their emotions, that is, learn to not think about what they're feeling. Women learn to remain silent, just like Jane Fonda or, or Rachel. That is, to not say what they know, to not see what they see, to not know what they know. Patriarchy, therefore, persists, first of all, for reasons that we see clearly, the power and status accorded through hierarchy and maintained through violence and control. But there is a deeper level on which patriarchy relies for its persistence. It is a training through which, when we become incapable of repairing relations, inca incapable to even believe in the possibility of uh, repairing them. The purpose of the gender initiation is precisely this, to make human relations impossible to make us believe in this impossibility and to take away the tools to repair relations. The paradox is that patriarchy works by twisting our defenses against us. It is at once a source of trauma, the loss of relationship, and a defense against it. Uh, and I quote uh, Gilligan, we avoid the very thing we want, love, so as to not be vulnerable again to a loss that has come to feel inescapable and unbearable. Patriarchy turns a defense from pain into damage, a pathology, which is why our ability to communicate our own feelings to others and thus to heal fractures in connection threatens the structures of hierarchy, that is, patriarchy's own existence. Trauma, uh, I'm about to conclude, trauma is what supports and nourishes patriarchy and the paradox, as I said, is that our coping strategies are turned against us and in favor of patriarchy's persistence. Connecting Gilligan's observations on patriarchy to all that I have come to know about what happens in prostitution has led me to see that patriarchy's deep functioning is the same as that at work in prostitution. Prostitution at this point reveals its centrality to the persistence of patriarchy on a double level. Not only is prostitution an extreme form of inequality and exploitation of women, of poor women from the South and the peripheries of the world, not only is it a reality that promotes and sustains male hegemony through bringing enormous economic gains to the sex industry, and at the same time, an, economic, an, an enormous quantity of women for men to abuse and exploit sexually. Besides being a symbolic confirmation and reinforcement of patriarchal models of masculinity and femininity, prostitution is the institution through which our society is trained and trapped into a mechanism of survival through detachment and dissociation, which goes to the advantage of the same structure that damages us. We have to stop practicing dissociation at a social level, stop not knowing what we know. The prostitution, that prostitution is not just violence, but the most extreme form of violence with terrible traumatic consequences for the people involved. As a great trauma uh, expert, Judith Ehrman tells us, it is conceivable that prostitution industry, which operates in virtually every society, might be a primary vector for socialization in the practices of coercive control. But as Gilligan's description of the deeper functioning of patriarchy hopefully has made clear, prostitution is the center from which patriarchy's teachings and initiation to the gender norms irradiate. I would say that prostitution reinforces a sexual binary intended, a sexual binary intended to control female bodies. Perhaps because we are being successful at unmasking patriarchy's mechanism, the binary is being substituted today with a gender multiplicity, but the intention and the result do not, change. do not change. Freedom for women is not from the body, but in the body, which is why understanding prostitution is so important and eliminating it altogether, the only way to dismantle patriarchy. 